Thank you, Pastor Jeremy, worship team band. If you are watching us live online, Facebook Live or YouTube, you know what to do. Hit that share button or ring the bell or whatever it is. Uh, it could actually change someone's life, change someone's eternity. If you are new today, it's our prayer that you would experience Jesus. Not the Journey Church, but Jesus. Because he is the only one who can change and transform your life. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Someone say, things above. On things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. When you and I come to Christ, it's no longer our story. It's now his story. It's no longer me making much of me. It's me making much of the one who gave me grace, mercy, and everlasting life. I want to ask you a question. Whether you are in this room or watching online, do you have a bucket list? A list of things that you want to do before you die. Also, do you know how the term bucket list originated? Buckets used to be used in the execution of hangings. People were made to stand on a bucket with their hands tied behind their backs, a noose around their neck, and at some point someone was given the cue to kick the bucket causing a sudden drop to death. It's where we get the term, I heard so-and-so kick the bucket. <laughs> so if the bucket represents the end of life on earth, then what we put in the bucket matters. In the movie The Dead Poets Society, 1989, Robin Williams plays a teacher by the name of John Keating. And there's this scene where he tells this class, these young men, that you are going to stop breathing, turn cold, and die. So seize the day. Make your lives extraordinary because one day you will be worm food. <laughs> the heartbeat of the bucket list is to fill your bucket before it gets kicked. Or as the great theologian Tim McGraw penned, live like you were dying. Many years ago, I met this stranger, and they looked at me and said, Wow, you look like Tim McGraw. And I said, Okay, that tells me one of two things about you. Either you're legally blind, yeah. or two, you know a Tim McGraw I don't know, but he looks really good. I'm just, I'm just saying. Listen, there, there's nothing wrong with having things that you want to do before you die. Make memories. Enjoy life. Go skydiving, Rocky Mountain climbing. Ride a bull named Fu Manchu. Yeah. But, and this is a really, really, really big but, if you think the things that you put in the bucket will complete you or somehow make the nagging feeling of emptiness go away, you are dead wrong. All of the accomplishments and successes of this world might fill the bucket, but it will never fill that empty side, that emptiness, that empty void inside of you. And yes, our culture says it, if you will just achieve it, if you will just build it, buy it, climb it, drive it, drink it, eat it, scale it, or even snort it, you will wake up 24-7, 365, fulfilled for the rest of your life. If you want to repeat history, if you want to repeat the same mistake over and over, if you want to keep stepping into stupid, do it the way you've always done it. But if you want to be used by God to make history, dare to be different. Dare to be set apart. I don't know about you, church, but I want to be a history maker. But here's the rub. At some point, we have to stop being conformed to this world around us and start walking in God's calling Amen. and God's purpose for our lives. I'm so jacked up today. I think I'll prime the pump. The Bible says you, you were bought with the blood of Jesus for a greater purpose. 
You don't belong to you. And yes, I know we have this thing called progressive Christianity. Do what you want. Do what feels good. Live your truth. But all of it's BS. It's bullshit. What were you thinking? You need revival. <laughs> Newsflash. Progressive Christianity and biblical Christianity are impossible roommates. And this is not judgment or pointing our finger at the world. This is a wake-up call for the church, for God's people. How can we expect revival when we scroll social media for five hours but struggle to spend five minutes in God's Word? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out, reveal anything in who? Me. That offends you, God, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. This week I wrestled with God. God, what do you want me to preach? What do your people need? What do I need? I had jotted down some thoughts on, on a document, but it just wasn't jiving. I, it just didn't feel right. So on Tuesday, I found myself in Luke chapter 17, where Jesus is talking about the end times and how it will be like the, like the days of Noah and the flood, like Sodom and Gomorrah, and then Jesus drops what seems like three insignificant random words that's found in Luke 17, 32. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. I... I've read past this so many times in my life. Never really stopped on it. Never really preached from that verse. Remember Lot's wife. Then Jesus dropped this truth bomb. He said, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. Sit up, church. Buckle up and listen up. As I close out our series, Revival Prep, with a message entitled, Are You Hungry? Yeah. Not are you physically hungry, because those who are fasting, you're hungry. <laughs> no, you're hangry. No, are you hungry for God? Yeah. Are you hungry for more of Him? Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Father, I pray God, I pray these three words would pierce our hearts and prepare us, your church, God's people, for revival. In one bold statement, Jesus gives all of us a bucket list warning when he references Genesis chapter 19 and the story of Lot and his wife, whose name is not even mentioned. Why not, preacher? I don't know. And you know what? It really doesn't matter. The city was Sodom and Gomorrah. Most Christians' recollection of these two cities is it's the place that received God's judgment. But in that day, Sodom was the place for bucket list living. It had 50-foot high walls, 17 feet thick. It was the safest place to live. It was financially thriving. It had arts, commerce, the dopest places to eat, outdoor activities, temples. Sodom was the thriving place to live. But it also had this dark and seductive underbelly because people who had lived there weren't satisfied. So it got darker and darker because when you don't look to God to give you what you need, you look somewhere else. No one watches porn and says, wow, that's exactly what I needed. I will never watch it again. Oh, we might think that in the moment, but when the high wears off, we usually find ourselves chasing after it again. And it's no different with alcohol, drugs, pleasure, possessions, or pride. In Sodom, the sins compounded itself to a place where God said in Genesis 13, 13, watch this, church, the people of this area were extremely, what? 
wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Now, according to Scripture, Lot was enticed by the pleasures of Sodom. But he also knew enough about God because of his uncle Abraham. He's the father of our faith, right? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. Now, if you're new to faith or never been to church, you're going, what just happened? Why are all these weird people singing the same song? I've never heard it before. <laughs> you have to grow up in church. And sometimes you're better off you didn't. <laughs> just kidding. Lean in. Don't miss this. Lot struggled with the tension of what to fill the empty hole in his heart with. How do you know that, preacher? How do you know that, Pastor Darrell? Because Genesis 13 says, when they were choosing where to live, Lot lifted his eyes and saw the plains of Jordan were well watered everywhere like the Garden of Eden. Many scholars believe Lot's phrase, like the Garden of Eden, was this idea, if he could live his life in Sodom, he would be fulfilled and free to live the carpe diem life. But as the story goes, and if you grew up in church, you know the story. Because of Abraham's relentless prayer, his relentless intercession of begging God to spare Lot and his family. The Bible says an angel was sent to rescue Lot and his family from the sins of Sodom. Oh, come on, Journey family. This is go God awesome. Abraham stood in the gap. He interceded on Lot's behalf, and it changed the course of history. Let's make it personal. Who are you standing in the gap for this revival? Who are you fasting for? Who are you praying for? Who are you going to call, text, or invite to sit with you next Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday? Who do you know who needs Jesus? What neighbor, what co-worker, what family member, what friend? Who is in danger of spending eternity in hell if they died tomorrow? If they died next week, next month? Are you willing to pray? Are you willing to fast for people by their name? Are you willing to get on your knees and cry out to God? Ask God to use you to point them to Him? As a church, we can sit back and criticize those in danger of God's judgment, or we can put ourselves in between them and God and point them to the only person who can transform their life. Stop pointing and start praying. Stop judging and point them to Jesus. The Bible says Abraham prayed, he interceded. And if you know the story, some angels came to rescue Lot and his family in Genesis 19. And as they're running, an angel warned them, don't look back at Sodom or you will be destroyed. Lot and his kids got out safely. But scripture tells us Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. Why did Jesus tell us to remember Lot's wife. What is the significance of those three words? Because Jesus doesn't waste one word, let alone three words. Why did the angel tell them not to look back, to keep moving forward or you will die? Why did Lot's wife do the one thing she was told not to do? Why did she look back? It's interesting, in the original language, the phrase look back is a picture of longing. It's a picture of lingering. In other words, she was looking back more with her heart than with her eyes. She wanted to go back to the thing that God was done with. She wanted the old lifestyle she was leaving behind more than what God had for her in the future. Her desires for what was cost her her life. Did you hear me? Her desires for what was 
cost her her life. Let's be honest. Filling our bucket is not always about future successes, future accomplishments, or wins. Sometimes we look in the rearview mirror to things that didn't fulfill us but gave us temporary pleasures. Oh, I, I enjoyed that season of sin. I enjoyed that struggle. I, I enjoyed that sin. And so we try to keep one foot in the world and one foot following Jesus, and that's impossible. First John chapter 2 says, do not love the world or anything in the world. The Bible says, pleasures of this world are fleeting. King Solomon, Bill Gates of the Bible, who had buckets and buckets of Benjamins, reflected on his emptiness of seeking satisfaction from earthly pleasures in this world. And he said this, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure, yet everything that I achieved was meaningless. He said it was like chasing the wind. Nothing was gained. He said nothing could fill this God-shaped hole inside of me but God. Amen. The other day I was scrolling social media and I saw this quote from Scotty Pippen who played with the Chicago Bulls 17 seasons. He played in the NBA. Six-time NBA championship because of Michael Jordan. <laughs> Let's just be honest. The GOAT, the greatest player ever. You can't argue it. Scottie Pippen earned over $110 million over 17 seasons. And he said, I have come to the conclusion that a $30 watch and a $30,000 watch both tell the same time. He said a Gucci wallet and a Target wallet hold the same amount of money. He said a $10 million home or a $100,000 home, and I don't know where those are. It's not here. He said both host the same loneliness. Wow. He said I've learned happiness is not found in materialistic things. So stay humble. Because the holes dug in the ground for all of us are the same size. Now, I don't know where Scottie Pippen is with his faith. I don't know if he has a relationship with Jesus. So I'll, so I'll throw this in at no charge. The flat line is not the finish line. When you die, you don't annihilate. You don't cease to exist. But one day you are going to die. One day you're going to leave planet Earth. And when you leave planet Earth, you're going to spend eternity somewhere forever. And forever is a long time to get it wrong. A long time. I promise you, nothing will fill the emptiness inside of you but Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, I am the one who gives eternal life. As Jesus people, we need to remember we can't follow Christ if we keep turning back to our old lifestyles. You can't run in two different directions. You're either, you're either running towards Jesus or away from him. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 32. He said, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Well, what is Paul saying in this text? He's saying, get everything you can out of this world if there's no resurrection. But if Jesus defeated death, and he did, and gave you an inheritance, a hope far beyond the bucket list living of this world, then why would you ever want the temporary pleasures of this world? Why? Why would you want the temporary pleasures of this world when you experience the power of the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves you, that he cleanses you, that he gives you a new name, a new identity? The shiny stuff of this earth pales in comparison to the value of eternity. Think about it. The pressure is off this life. 
when you don't need the boat, when you don't need the new vehicle, when you don't need the new house. Watch this to fill that empty hole inside of you. So when you do have the boat, and you do have the vehicle, and you do have the house, and there's nothing wrong with having possessions, but you realize they're all a gift. They're all a blessing from God to make memories, to use as a ministry, to do life with my family, with friends, with coworkers and neighbors. You see, when we hold everything loosely and say, God, you are my greatest treasure. Everything that I have comes from you, is because of you. Nothing gets in the way of putting God first in your finances. But when you think, look what I've earned, look what I've done, look at what I've put in the bucket, we live like this. It's mine. I worked hard. I labored. Listen, God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. God doesn't need your money. He owns everything. He owns the very heartbeat in your chest. He decides whether you take your next breath. Why wouldn't you live like this? God wants to be first in every area of our lives. As Christians, all of us live and work around people who don't know Christ. And here's the truth. They are watching how we lead. They are watching how we live, how we love, how we work. What we do on Sundays, I think I'll say that again, what we do on Sundays, if skipping church is a crime, we'd have a lot of Christians in prison for life. (laughs) Like you're on death row, (laughs) kind of kidding, but serious at the same time. How can God's house not be a priority? And I get it, we all go on vacations and we all have days we need to just stay home, watch online. But when you show up once a month, once every six weeks, how can you live in community? How can you be a part of what God's doing? Here's the deal, what we are not changing, we are choosing. I pray that our worship is not just loud, but lived out loud. Worship is more than standing and screaming and jumping up and down and getting excited. Worship is a lifestyle. There's something about being marked by heaven. Being marked by a changed life. In Philippians 3, Paul said, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Someone say one thing. thing. Forgetting the past. You can't change the past. Failure doesn't have to be fatal. God says, get up. Turn around. Live again. All of us make mistakes. All of us drop the ball. All of us step into stupid sometimes. But you don't have to live there. You don't have to stay there. Focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking what forward to what lies ahead. Paul said, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Paul is saying in this text, I refuse, I refuse to chase after useless crowns when I am called to chase after the heart of God. Our greatest prize is Jesus. Our greatest prize is heaven. Here's a question for you to think about. If you lost everything tomorrow, is Jesus enough? If he stripped everything away and all you had is Jesus, is he enough? The less this life becomes our oyster, the less it will be our treasure. And you can store up as many treasures in this bucket as you want. But guess what? When you leave, they're all staying in the bucket. You can have big buckets and not lie. 
but they're not going with you. You will never fulfill your hunger or quench your thirst drinking from the wrong bucket. In other words, when you show up for church, show up hungry for God's word. Show up hungry like you're going to your favorite restaurant. When I go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse, I'm showing up hungry and expectant because I know what's waiting for me. A cowboy ribeye, lobster mac and cheese, cream spinach, sweet potato casserole, and chocolates and cake for dessert. And yes, I'm still fasting. That's why I'm so passionate right now. I had a bowl of pinto beans last night. I couldn't sleep for hours. Blew up like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Thank God Kara slept through it. I'm sorry. This book is not a cheap sirloin. You can't dress up a sirloin. This book is a Wagyu bone-in ribeye. This is God's word. It's living, it's active, it's alive. It changes our life and points out areas of our lives that don't belong there. This is a love story from our creator to his creation. When you open up God's word, be expectant, be hungry. Say, God, speak to me. Can I ask you a question? Are you living outside in or inside out? Are you being conformed to the culture around you? Or are you being transformed by the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of you? Be honest, which one? In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is talking to this guy who wanted to build a bigger barn because his old barn wasn't big enough to store up all of his crap. Let's just be honest. All of his earthly possessions. I I have to build a bigger barn. But when he died, the first word he heard standing before God was, You fool. You fool. And by the way, all of us one day have to stand before God. And give an account of our sin. Or give an account how we lived our lives as Christians. And if you have to stand before God for your sin, it's too late. The Bible says, God will say, depart from me for I never knew you. He said, you fool. You valued most what you could hold on to the least. Do you realize no matter what you put in this bucket, you're not taking it with you. I don't care how many garages you have, how many houses, how many rooms. And again, there's nothing wrong with having that stuff as long as that stuff doesn't have you. As long as we know where the blessings come from. As long as we live open-handed. Say, God, you gave it to me. So if you told me tomorrow to sell it, I'd sell it. If you told me to give it away, I'd give it away. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, what do you benefit? If you gain the whole world but lose your own soul, is anything worth more than your soul? In total contrast, the Bible says in Matthew 13, 44, watch this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. What Jesus did for all of us to obtain eternal life, to obtain salvation, forgiveness, mercy, and grace is off the charts, mind-blowing. How much is Jesus worth to you? Let's land the plane. One final question. Are you a thermometer that conforms and imitates our culture 
Or are you a thermostat that infiltrates this culture with the life-changing gospel of God's amazing grace? I promise you, God wants to write a bigger story if you are willing to live different, if you are willing to live set apart. Legacy is not what you accomplish. Legacy is what others accomplish because of you. It's called discipleship. Be one. Discipleship is God using us to grow fruit on other people's trees. It's not about us. Think about it. What we get to do today. will change generations to come. What we get to do today will not only change our children's children, but their children. Right? We get to dig ditches and they get to live in the blessings of it. To have greater faith, greater purpose, to do greater things for God. We've got to set them up for success, not failure. We've got to prepare the way. Life is not a dress rehearsal. We get one shot at this thing called life and that's it. So why wouldn't we prepare the path for our grandchildren and their children? Psalms 102.18 says, let this be recorded for future generations. Someone say future generations. So that a people not yet born will what? Praise the Lord. What Christ wants to do through us is, is above our pay grade. Yeah. It's more than we can do in our own power. Yeah. It requires surrender to the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. Yeah. Oswald Chambers said, There is no power on earth or in hell that can conquer the Spirit of God in a believer sold out to Christ. Yeah. The question is, are we willing to say, God, wave the white flag. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of chasing after the things of this world. I want you. I need you. Let's double down. If you look for an excuse not to come to revival, you will find it. If you look for reasons you can't be here, you'll find them. Or you can say, God, I know I'm busy, but I'm going to create margin. I'm going to clear my calendar, and I'm going to ask you to start revival in me. And I pray, God, you would take that revival from here to my home, to my workplace, to my neighborhood, into the gym, the grocery store, and every single place I go. God, change me, and then use me to change those around me. God's not asking you to change the entire world. He's asking you to change your world. Your circle of influence. Ask God, start revival in me. You know what I believe? I believe when we ask God to start revival in me, the enemy of darkness will look under his bed before he goes to bed at night because he knows you're praying a prayer (laughs) that will give you the courage to charge hell with a squirt gun. That boy won't be able to sleep. Satan will be like, oh my gosh. God's people are praying. God's people are fasting. They're getting the courage to go live the life God's already given to them. We don't work for victory. We work from victory. We are already victorious, church. We just got to walk in it. We got to live in it. If we are hungry for a supernatural move of God, guess what? We will experience God's purpose. Not only for this church, but for our community. But here's the deal. God always does the super, but we're required to do the natural. We're required to do our part. So here's how I want to close. I want everyone to stand to your feet. And my challenge is, is for you to come to this front.
take communion and then get on your face before God and say, God, start revival in me. Start revival in me. Who will be the first to come? God, have your way. Move among your people. Shift the atmosphere. Pray, God, we would not leave this place until we've done business with you. Use this, Father God. Use this church. Use your people. Pray all of this in Jesus' name.